when the ultimate realization of the self happens, it occurs instantaneously. In fact, it it occurs outside of time because that is what is realized, the timeless self, the self beyond the world, the self that is unchanging, the self that is then realized to be all that is real, or ever was or shall be, truly real. But the process leading up to that realization that delivers one from the bondage of the illusion of time and false consciousness limited to the mistaken identification with a temporary bodily form. That process is gradual. It must be gradual because the human intelligence cannot grasp that mystery. But that within us, which is the self, always knows. But how does the attention of consciousness stuck in the identification with the bodily ego and with all of the practical issues that the ego mind must pay attention to while the body is alive in order to deal with life cope with its demands, to cope with the inner, the inner drives of the ego itself, its impulses, its greed, its sexual desire, its fear of not having enough, its fear of loneliness. How does one deal with all of those psychological difficulties, the economic difficulties, the social family enmeshments, and navigate one's way to an understanding of who one really is? For most individuals in the world, in fact, that question never arises. They're too busy dealing with the practicalities of life to actually take an interest in such a question. And generally, if someone asks them, who are you, they're satisfied to give a certain answer. I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a musician, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm a... I'm a seeker, I'm a religious person, I believe in God, I believe in whatever dogma, the Buddha, I believe in the Tao, I believe in this or that. And they are satisfied to settle for a a religious concept or an atheist concept or a nihilistic concept and simply leave the issue behind and... uh, Go on with life within the phenomenal plane and cease asking the question, who am I beyond all of those activities and social roles and interests of taking care of certain others and being loved by certain others, rejected by others fearing loss of one's job, 
loss of one's abilities to function as the body gets older. It's all of those anxieties and cares that take over the mind. And so life becomes one-dimensional, and most beings are satisfied with dealing with that dimension of bodily life in the best way they can, having their momentary enjoyments, going to concerts, going to nice restaurants, dealing with the pains and aches of aging, trying to stay fit, running, exercising in various ways, sometimes participating in extreme thrills, trying to climb a mountain or scale a cliff wall or jump out of an airplane, or they take up some kind of activity that's competitive to prove their manhood or they'll enter a beauty contest to prove their feminine glory. Whatever it is that becomes one's ideal, one may want to become the world's best rock star or actress, or one wants to serve uh, like Albert Schweitzer in, in Africa, be a missionary who helps the world helps cure diseases, a research scientist who discovers the cause of cancer. People will have all kinds of goals in life that will be based on the premise that what they are is a bodily being, and that's all the world consists of, is other bodily beings. And how can we make their lives more comfortable? How can I make mine the most comfortable? And uh, to try to deal with it within the constraints of the paradigm of the finite consciousness. But for some, a few, that's not enough. For a very few, the urgency of discovering who am I beyond this body? Is there an I that survives the death of this body? And if so, can I know that I now, while the body's alive? Well, it's this question that was ignited for Sri Ramana, although we should call him at that point by his birth name, Venkatarama, when he was 12 years old. And his sadhana began, his actual intensive self-enquiry, began at age 12, and it culminated when he was 16 in his famous death experience, when the terror of death overcame him, and he chose not to run away from it, but to face it and to find out what was this death that he was apparently so afraid of. And the problem was solved because He went beyond the boundaries of life and discovered for himself the self that is beyond both life and death. But the question became urgent for him at age 12 because he witnessed the death of his beloved father. And seeing the father, seeing the father's body lying there as a corpse was a traumatic shock for Venkataraman. He wasn't sad. The feeling he had was more of, of awe, of wonder. Because he, he, when he, he said, what happened to my father? And they said, well, this isn't your father. This corpse is, is, is not your father. This was just the vehicle he used. Your father has left. And, and, and he immediately was awakened. My father has left? You mean that's not my father? All along I took that body to be my father. Now now you're telling me, no, no, your father actually was occupying the body and now he's gone. Well, then Katraman wondered, well then, where did he go? 
what was this self of my father that I thought I loved, that I never knew? And what happens to that self after the body is a corpse? Does its mind remain? Because he knew his father's mind was totally concerned with the well-being of the family, with his profession. He was a kind of an attorney, and he took care of many people, mediated village disputes, and dealt with many, many issues that were of, of importance to uh, the town and, and to uh, the life of, of the larger clan of which he was part of. And, and he participated avidly in social activities. Would that mind, would that be relevant to the self that left these conditions? Or would that mind die along with the, the organism? And if that's true of my father, that his body is just a dead corpse, and that he was never that body ever in the first place, well, isn't that true for me as well? And not only do I not know who my father was, I don't know who I am. And what will happen to this eye when this body is a corpse and people are conducting a funeral for this corpse? And who is this I who is thinking these thoughts now? Who is this I who wonders this? And so his process of self-inquiry intensely went on from that moment on, questioning and needing, needing to know the answer of who is this I that I am but I do not know, and whose destiny I do not know, but the knowledge of which seems to me far more important than just going on with life, trying to study the subjects in high school and play soccer and do and cricket and all the things that Indian boys do. He totally lost interest in any of that. He was totally consumed by this question because he knew that many people die when they're much younger than his father. He, is, he saw boys die in accidents, in drowning in the lake, in various ways. So he knew, he had no idea how long he had even to consider this question before his own body was lying dead somewhere. And so that became the highest priority of this 12-year-old boy's existence. And because he had no interest in a future career or in getting married or in developing a life in the world which he felt would only be a distraction from being able to focus on this question, he organized his life in such a way that he could spend most of his time at the local temple in meditation, in contemplation of the I that he now was so urgently questing to know. And he became more and more isolated from the family and from the activities of the other adolescents. He didn't do so well in school. None of those subjects mattered anymore. They would only be temporary knowledge anyway and limited. And he discovered soon that whatever they taught soon changed. New scientific discoveries, new inventions. You know, this was the early 20th century and he was learning about cars and airplanes and telegraphs and telephones and all kinds of things were coming into Indian life that had never existed before. And so it was all a flux. He realized that. And whatever you learned would soon be obsolete anyway. 
And so he wanted to focus on what was not going to become obsolete, what was not stuck in time, what was not temporary. And if this self indeed transcends the life of the body and is immortal and eternal, well, that's what one needs to know while one is alive to be able to consider the question. And so that became his, his, his full, full-time occupation in waking life. He went to school, he did those things, but his mind was always on that question of who am I? Well, at age 16 then, the quest culminated because he could no longer avoid the question because the fear of the very death that would force him and enable him to know the self suddenly took him in an overwhelming surge of fear that he did not want to distract himself. He wasn't interested in taking a pill to relieve his anxiety or going to a priest to ask for some kind of absolution before his death or any of that. He wasn't, wasn't interested in running into the arms of his mother to be soothed. He, now he felt, that, well, this was his opportunity. I'm in the grip of this power that's possessing me with this terror of the boogeyman of death, but this is exactly what I, I want to know, what death is. And so he went for it, and he lay on the ground, and he allowed his body to feel as dead as he could, held his breath, but he wasn't thinking because he understood that as a corpse, uh, they don't seem to be thinking. They're not aware of anything outside of whatever it is that the self is that, that leaves. And so... He, he turned his attention completely within and let go of any last remaining interests in his bodily life. And he crossed over that threshold into the land of death. And he discovered the deathless self. He attained the realization that he is that. And he never returned to life, because he didn't need to, he was in eternal life, but he never returned into the usual condition of consciousness, being consumed by the cares of, of bodily life. At that moment, he became completely desireless, because the search was fulfilled. There was nothing more that needed to be known, the self was realized, and now... That's all that remained. And therefore the body has had no more desire, no more karma. The life of the body was irrelevant to the life of the self. And the last thing that remained was after the fear of death was gone and the fulfillment of the realization of Satchitananda was complete in that timeless moment, was that the body of Venkataraman was magnetically drawn to the holy mountain of Arunachala. Not through a conscious desire to get there, but there was simply almost a sleepwalking of the body to the railway station and clumsily try, finding the train through help of others to get to this town that he didn't even know where it was or what stop to get off on. And, uh, and, and because others uh, who uh, had compassion for this seemingly lost child, they, they helped him and he found his way to the Arunachala temple. At first he ripped off his clothes at the local reservoir and, and, and uh, shaved his head and, and became a sannyasi ripped his clothes to shreds, kept a loincloth, and, and he found his way to the temple and sat there. Because now he had arrived 
where his destiny had brought him, and the phys- but it wasn't him any longer, it was the body. He didn't move, he never went to Arunachala, because Arunachala for him was Shiva, and he never left Shiva, because Shiva is simply the name of the self. And there's nothing but that. It's hard for anyone to conceive of the state of consciousness he was in, because it's not a, a human state of consciousness. It's nothing within the range of human experience. He was beyond that spectrum. So it can't be conceived of. And he sat there in front of the Shiva Lingam. Eventually he he found the Lingam in the basement because he wanted to avoid the kids who were making fun of him and some throwing rocks at this motionless, kid who didn't, didn't eat, didn't uh, seem to care about anything, didn't talk, wasn't interested in playing or uh, doing anything. He was, his body was simply there, more or less like a living corpse. And he didn't care. He was finally sometimes force-fed by people who didn't want him to starve, but very rarely did Anyone even remember that this unknown kid was there? Remember, he had no contacts, no support network, no family living in Tiruvannamala, completely alone, completely penniless, completely without any resources, and completely without fear or desire. He wasn't there. He was in the dimension of the self an entirely different real than the one that the human ego mind can grasp or, or can, can realize the implications of. But because Tiruvannamalai was a pilgrim site and there were many sadhus, many nearly enlightened, some, some actually liberated sages. Uh, one named Sashadri Swami actually uh, saw this young lad and recognized he was shining, he was in Vairagya, this, he had completed the quest, he, he had reached this totally desireless state. And, and he, he understood he was in the presence of, of a liberated sage. And it was very odd to see a liberated sage, age 17, and not interested in, in doing anything, teaching or trying to uh, study scriptures or, or transmit knowledge, but simply abiding in that ultimate state of samadhi and, and completely surrendered to whatever the vicissitudes of the fate of the organism would be. Eventually, people took him under his wing, and and a a man who recognized his his stature on a spiritual level, Palani Swami, uh, guided him out of this hell realm of the basement of the temple where his body was being eaten gradually by ants and cockroaches and other various creatures, and uh, brought him up the hill to uh, a cave where a sage had lived hundreds of years earlier, named Virupaksha, and, uh, and it was empty. Who wanted to live in a little cave and, and on the hill? Uh, no one was interested, so uh, he took it. He lived there. He didn't do much. He sat there, just as he had in the temple. And it wasn't he sitting there, his body sat there. The self, as I say, was already beyond this dimension. But eventually, people visited, wondered, who, who is it here who's squatting in this cave? And uh, who is this, this kid who is sitting, shining, with total seeming bliss on, on, on the expression on his face? but who had no interest in communicating or asking for help or interacting in any way. 
But people began to sit near him because when they sat around him, they felt differently. They felt his energy. They felt the bliss. They, they could see the light emanating from his aura. They could feel the power that was being emitted from this motionless body. And they wanted to know, who is this? Where is he? What has he discovered? What can I learn from this being who has no cares, no worries, and seems completely happy? And who, by sitting near him, made them happy? And so people began to ask him questions. And he wasn't asleep, he wasn't in a trance, he was fully present, and yet present in a way that no one else was present. And so out of compassion, when he was asked questions, if his body couldn't talk, he would write the answer with a finger in the sand. And he was able to give such clear answers to the questions of spiritual seekers that they were amazed. And so gradually he became renowned as a wise being to whom one could go to resolve the doubts that they had from reading all the shastras and the, the holy texts of various kinds that left them wondering about the ultimate reality that was glorified in the Upanishads and in all those ancient texts and whether that was real, and here they saw a living example of that. And so they received the answers that suddenly opened their third eye, that changed their lives. And then many wanted to be guided to be able to enter the same state that he had entered, and not out of any desire of his own, he acquiesced because it didn't matter what his body did. And if this is what God wanted his body to do, it, it mattered not. He was no longer identified with it or interested in the outcome of its activities. Because he recognized that this world was a dream, he, the dreamer, was out of the dream. and The dream had no interest. And for him, it was no longer even a dream. And this is what I think can't be grokked by an ego. He was not even aware of what we think of as a real world. Because for him, the dream had ended. He had awakened from it. But his body remained in others' dreams. The dreams of those who sought answers. And so the body became a vehicle for the service of the upliftment of the consciousness of those who wanted to get out of their dream. And so his, his uh, answers became compi compiled into a book and then another book. And his writing career seemed to take off. His books became very popular. But... It wasn't his career, and he had no interest in being a writer. Others published the books, and, and they were disseminated, and people read them, and suddenly they were drawn to find this guy on the hill in this little cave and discover if they couldn't find the answer to the question, who am I? And they did. And so eventually, without his having any interest in it at all, his, he became somewhat of a worldwide celebrity. His picture was once on the, on the front of Look magazine, and people like Paul Brunton, uh, famous uh, uh, writers, wrote books about him. And Yogananda came to visit him, and, uh, and, and many other yogis and... Uh, and, and spiritual uh, teachers. But 
the Ramana who, who spoke to them was not the bodily being, but that self that spoke through the being was completely transcendent of all worlds. And that Ramana, that self, when the, the corpse of the body was enshrined, had no interest, and people before he died asked him uh, and cried, don't go. He said, I'm not going anywhere. The self never moves or leaves. Don't identify the self that has been teaching you all these years and, and, and giving you this energy with this body. The self is here always. And the self is not simply located in this body. The same self is in your body. You're no different than I am. You're the same one. There's only one. And that's why it wasn't necessary to name a successor. Why do you need it when everyone is already the self? They don't need an outer guide, they just need to turn within. And they'll make the same discovery for themselves, for the, the, of the self, that everyone who completes that journey to realization arrives at and discovers there never was an everyone, but only the one self. The multiplicity exists only for the ego mind identified with the body. And each ego lives in its own world. It has no real contact with anyone else except its own projections. The world is the dream of the ego. But beyond that, the blissful, eternal, real of the self always abides beyond all that seems to be to the limited mind of the ego. And always, sooner or later, in the illusion of time, brings one home to that same realization of the one self that occurred in India some time ago and will occur for each of us in the moment of the choosing of the self to reveal its true nature to you. And so Ramana did not emphasize any effort that needed to be made. When the spark of desire and yearning to know the self was ignited, it would itself lead you to the answer. You didn't need to do exotic pranayamas and all kinds of other techniques of repetition of mantras and ceremonial worship and all of that. In fact, you had to let go of all of that and just turn within and find out what you are when you have lost interest in all of those external things, including your own mind as an external th object, and turn within deeper than the mind can reach until you attain the pure awareness beyond the mind and beyond the illusion that the mind projects. And that is liberation. And that is our natural state. And when we all, each of us in our own moment, awaken from their dream, will discover the same destination of that blissful light, power, presence 
from which we have never actually been separated. It was only a mistaken idea, mistaken identity. But the real identity has always been the same. And within, at the level of the self, we always know. And we know it even while we have forgotten it in the ego. And we know it because we are never anything but that. Mm -hmm.